You know, being that we are two Sundays uh, into the month of November, I believe it's safe to say that the holiday season is officially upon us. Right, Thanksgiving is approximately two weeks away, and some of you are like, yeah, I can't, can't wait, right? And then Christmas will come just a month after that. And when it comes to the holiday seasons, they don't just fall upon us, right? They don't just kind of come out of nowhere unless we're oblivious to what day of the week and month it is, right? Because it's, it's, it isn't a holiday that it is observed on that day, but it, it is a holiday season for a reason. And that's because it goes on for a duration of time and we observe it, we see, we participate in it through decorations, through gatherings of whatever sorts, and of course, appropriately themed music. But one, one of the things that surround these holidays as we spend time with family and friends is we tend to reflect on life. And as we reflect on life, I think one of the conclusions that many of us draw is we start to count our what? Our blessings. Or at least I would hope you would do so. You see, as you start to count your blessings, you start to realize all of the reasons you have to be thankful for. Or you reflect on how you've been blessed. Or you start to come to terms with how you would consider yourself blessed with all things considered. Because maybe it hasn't been the best of year for you. And what does that do? That as you start to count your blessings, as you start to become thankful, what that does is that stirs up this part of our hearts that causes us to not only be even more thankful, but out of that thankfulness comes this push to be generous in some capacity. Right? And usually it ends up with us being a little bit more generous than we normally are. That is, unless your name is Ebenezer Scrooge. And so in this season of being thankful, what you'll see or what you used to see is people from like, I don't know, the Salvation Army who would uh, ring their bells as you would exit or enter into your shopping market, uh, uh, your, your grocery store of choice, your, your malls, and, and so forth, right? So that after you would come out after purchasing all these things, whether it be groceries for your family gatherings or your parties, or you come out of a store after spending money on presents, that you would look and you would see these people and you would probably feel a little guilty. And so what you would do is you kind of search for whatever change you have left over and you would throw it into that red bin. See, nowadays when you go to restaurants and even bigger stores, they've gotten smarter, they've gotten more creative, right? Because what they ask you, sir, would you like to round up to a dollar to donate to the children's hospital? Or when you go to Costco, right, and they have their, their, their campaigns, sir, would you like to donate a dollar and get one of these papers and write your name on it for everyone to see? The other day, I went to Panda Express, and it's like, sir, would you like to round up for charity? And for me, and I, I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes I say yes, and sometimes I, I say no. And there are times where I have peace with it, and then there's other times I feel really guilty that I'm about to eat this food, and I, I don't want to make a donation every time I come to this establishment. That's kind of how we are, right? We, 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 in, in, this, uh, in this season of, of being thankful, sometimes it feels like we're being uh, pressured in to give. There are times where it feels like we, we, we feel guilty and we, like, we feel compelled to give out of our guilt. Now, as followers of Christ, we should be generous. Yes? Right? We, we should be givers because of how blessed we are, not because of how rich we are. We are all in some sort of place to give. And it's not always about the amount that's important. But what we see in our giving, especially as we look at our scripture today, it's not necessarily the amount, but it's about what? The heart, right? Like, we, we shouldn't be guilt-tripped into giving. And what scripture also teaches us is that we shouldn't give reluctantly. And what that means, uh, I don't, right, it, sh it shouldn't be a struggle. You see, when you and I are in a position to give and we do give, it is something that should be done out of what? Joy. It should be done out of 
honor, not honoring yourself or honoring that person, but because you're honoring God. And when we think about the ways that we are able to give, these are all facets of us being able to not only give God honor, but also give him glory. We're in a season where giving is highlighted, right? It reminds me of this time uh, my friends and I went out to eat when we were in seminary. And, you know, now my, my seminary school, right, before we, you judge us, is my seminary school was comprised of people studying to become pastors. You had people studying to become missionaries. You had people who wanted to be a part of an, an NGO, right, a nonprofit. And then our, our school also had a, a subset of a school, a division that was dedicated to people who were studying psychology and because they wanted to become psychologists or family therapists and so forth. So a lot of us, we, we hung out together, and being the broke students that we are, right, doesn't matter if you're an undergrad or graduate school, uh, because you ain't really working, you were, everyone's broke, right? And so what we would do is we would go to the mailbox in, in, in the common area, and we would search for food coupons, right? Maybe you're, you get those at your house, like the Subway ones, the Burger King, the Arby's, or whatever, right? There was a one place in particular that whenever we could find a coupon for this place, we would go. It was called Boston Markets. I don't know if you guys remember Boston Market. There used to be one on 38th Street over uh, in, in Tacoma, where uh, close, pretty close to where Harvest Buffet is, right? But anyways, right, uh, we, there's a Boston Market in Pasadena, California, and what we would do is there would be this coupon that was $3.99, and you can, get, you can eat good for $3.99, right? For us, it was a really good lunch. You were saving money, but then the, one day we went, the lady asked, would you like to donate a dollar? to help the inner city youth. And for us, we're like, we're, we're, we're thankful, right? Like, oh, we're feeling, we're feeling, we're feeling great. And so yes, out, out of the joy that we were experiencing, it was, oh yeah, sure. But you know, giving that dollar meant that maybe you couldn't get a fountain drink that day, right? But still, because we were, we were feeling grateful, we said, okay, no, sure, no problem. It's for a good cause, why not? I'm feeling blessed today, and let me give a dollar. And then one of our friends went up and ordered his food using the coupon as well. And the cashier asked the question, would you like to donate a dollar to help the inner city youth? Right? Mind you, we just saved a lot of money. We're eating good. We should be feeling happy. And my friend, who is my friend to this day, says, nah, but can I get a brownie? Right? And so all of us who are waiting for our friend to finish ordering, all of a sudden stopped and said, whoa. And his name's Dave. He goes, Dave, you don't love the kids? Hey, hey, Dave don't love the kids, right? So what we ended up doing is we started giving him a hard time. We started peer pressuring him, started pushing him, trying to make him feel guilty so that he would donate a dollar. And guess what he did? He didn't donate the dollar, right? And still to this day, Dave does not love the kids, right? We, it's something we give him a hard time about every single time. But the, you know, the reality is, is we all give something, right? Our, our hearts are usually compelled to give something. But in our giving, what we really need to examine is our hearts. Because when you think about the capacity in which we give, some people give, right? And I'm not, I'm not thinking of anybody in particular. So if you think I'm talking about you specifically, I'm not, I have no idea. But I know that there are people in life who like to give because it makes them feel good. But it also makes them look good. Some people give out of compulsion or because they want to give or outgive their rival. Oh, so and so donated $100 to that. Well, I'm better than so and so, so let me donate $120. Oh, so and so donated $120. I'm better than him, so let me donate $150. Right? Some of us, that's how we function. Right? There are people who give because there's peer pressures. Some people give because they just, it makes them feel good. And then there are people who give as a response to the gratitude that they have in their life. And some people give because they know what it's like to be in that particular situation. And I should add that it is completely possible to give selfishly while giving off the impression that you are a generous person. Nonetheless, we have to examine the heart in which we are giving. To the outside, I can look great, but with ourselves and especially with God, we have to examine our hearts. Today in our scripture, Paul talks about what it means to be a cheerful giver and how that is pleasing to God. And so our goal today is to understand what it means to be a cheerful giver, how God encourages us to be a cheerful giver, 
and why we should strive to be a cheerful giver. And so using our scripture today, there are three things for us to observe, learn, and hopefully adhere to in our own lives as we seek to honor God, not just with our living, but also our giving. The first thing is this. When it comes to being a cheerful giver, right? When it comes to being a cheerful giver, giving is a decision that must be made with our hearts, right? It's something that must be done with our hearts. Being a cheerful giver isn't something that we should do spontaneously, irresponsibly, or even irrationally. Let me say it again just in case you missed it, right? When it comes to being a cheerful giver, that isn't something that you should do spontaneously, irresponsibly, or even irrationally. You see, being a cheerful giver isn't this green light to be reckless or even foolish with how we give. Being a cheerful giver is something that should be accompanied with good stewardship. Notice I'm not, I'm not saying, like, hey, let's empty our pockets. That's not what I'm saying. Right? This is something that you, have at the end of the day, have to have peace with and be able to do freely. You see, when we look at verses 6 to 7, Paul writes this. He says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. But notice what is connected with this. He says, each one must give as he has decided in his where? Heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves what? A cheerful giver. You see, now we have to be careful with how we approach and understand what Paul is saying. Because if we are not careful, we can misunderstand what Paul is communicating. Or we can even be misguided with how we approach our giving. And so, yes, Paul is talking about sowing and reaping sparingly. He also mentioned in the same conversation how you can bountifully sow and reap. But all these things are based off of how we give. And so there can be this expectation of if you give a little, you will receive what? A little. And if you give more, you can have an expectation that you will receive more. But there's no, and there's no mistake that the amount given is closely tied to the intention of our giving. You see, if we are not careful, if we are not in the right place with the right heart, we can give with a selfish expectation. Right? We can give with an unhealthy posture. What I mean by that is that we can give with a sense of entitlement, thinking, God, I gave you this much, pay up. God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this amount, and I'm going to expect that same amount, if not more, in return as a blessing. I have news for you. That's with the wrong heart. That's with the wrong posture. You see, the bigger thing for us to take note of is that Paul warns us about giving reluctantly or even under compulsion. In other words, that the way that you and I should understand that is that Paul is calling for us to give with a discerning heart. Right? He wants us to give with the right heart. And I see this a lot, right? I'm a victim of it. I'm guilty of it, right? I see this happen a lot with sponsoring children, right? You know? World, World Vision shows up. They show you the video. They pass out their cards and say, hey, sponsor a child, right? Compassion International shows up. They, pass, they show you the videos. They pass out the cards and say, sponsor a child, right? You go to the mall and there's organizations like Save the Children who show up and they say, hey, you want to sponsor a child? All it takes is $1 a day. And what do we do? We make the commitment, but we do so emotionally because we see we've been persuaded and what ends up happening, we cancel, those, we cancel those commitments. And who suffers as a result of us making a decision that wasn't based off of the heart, that wasn't being uh, done discerningly? It's who? It's those children. Do you, see what, do you see where I'm going with this? 
You see, when we think about the ways that we give and the things that we are committing to with our giving, that means that we have to approach it with the right heart. And how do we approach things with the right heart? What do you think we do first? Pray. Yes? And so when you think about the ways that you give or the commitments that you're making to your giving, I believe Scripture is highly encouraging us to pray. And in our praying about our giving, I think it's something that it's okay to say that we need to do so strategically. And you're like, what do you mean like having a strategy in terms of your giving? Like, once again, it says don't give what? Under compulsion or reluctantly. But it needs to be a decision that's made in our heart. And one of the things that hurts my heart to hear is people who give in faith when they don't have the means. And they think that they're going to get more. People who would empty their, their bank accounts to, to give for whatever cause because they've been misled with the, gospel, the prosperity gospel. And they think, oh, because I give, because I give, because I'm giving, God's going to bless me in return. And in that, in that faith, even though it's misguided, they wait and they wait only to be disappointed. I hear of people who give irresponsibly, irresponsibly because they believe that God is going to provide even more. That's how people are being persuaded and manipulated. And that's not how it works. That's not how God provides or blesses us. There's, there's no deals being made. Right? We, we can't think that we're, we're, we're making a deal with God because of the way that we're giving, that he's going to return it in that, in that exact amount, if not with, with interest. We would be misguided. And I have a news for you, you'll be disappointed. You see, our giving needs to be done responsibly and from our hearts. And so if you want to be someone who is able to give more, then guess what? You're going to need to prepare yourself to be in a position to give more. Not, not under compulsion, not spontaneously, not irresponsibly, but through prayer, through the discerning of your heart. Give. And as you give, challenge, ask God to challenge you to give more. For example, when I was in youth group, I remember hearing a story of this person who would carry gift cards in his wallet because he wanted to be in a position to help somebody who was hungry, right? And obviously, around this area, the greater Puget Sound area, you have people who are constantly asking you for, hey, can I get a dollar? Do you have any change? And our hope is that they would use it for food, not for any other things. And so one way to prevent that is that he would strategically buy gift cards, and I don't know, the amount of $5. And so if someone were to ask him for money so that they could give him food, he would say, here, here's a $5 gift card to McDonald's. Please go get yourself something to eat. When I heard that, when I think about that, that's being strategic, right? That's being prepared. That's making that decision in your heart that when the opportunity arises, you're able to give. You see, at the end of the day, giving as a result of the decision that is made in your heart means that as we give, there will be no hesitation. There will be no unpreparedness. Right? There will be no second guessing. And there will be no giver's remorse. Have you guys ever had giver's remorse? When you, you, you make a donation, you go, oh man, I shouldn't have given that much. Right? That's, that's all. No. You don't want to be in that position. Giving is something that must be prepared, and it's done with the heart. You see, instead, of our, instead, our giving should give us a satisfaction that inspires us to continually look to God, to continually trust Him, and know that He is satisfied with our giving. The second thing is this. When we think about our scripture, as we're going through it, when it comes to being a cheerful giver, we have to understand that God enables us to continually be a cheerful giver, right? So when it comes to being a cheerful giver, let alone someone who wants to give, one of the hesitancies that we face is not necessarily running out, but not having enough, right? Like, have you ever been like, oh, I, I wish I could give more? Or if I give this, I'm, I'm just not going to have enough for myself. And so if I, if, I, if I give, then I won't be able to do this. I won't have enough or there won't be anything left over for me. And so what happens to our giving? What happens to our heart or posture of giving? We become what? Reluctant. We become hesitant. And obviously that's not what God wants us to do or be, God doesn't want us to be in that kind of position. 
right? And, and what happens when we become reluctant to give, it prevents us from being generous in the capacity that we would want to be because we fear we won't have the means. You see, in my house, for whatever reasons, my, my kids, they're listening all of a sudden, right? They don't like sharing, right? You, if you, for those of you who have raised children, right? Whatever it is, brothers and sisters, they don't like sharing. It's like you're asking them to do the most painful thing in life. And because of that, we'll have the kids fight. But one of the things I try, I, my, my wife and I try to do is uh, we try to instill this mentality into our kids. Meaning that if you don't share, then guess what? That's not going to make me want to buy, that's not going to make us want to buy you whatever is going to run out. And so in our house, the, the thing that they fight over most, for whatever reason, I have no idea are markers, right? Markers that they could color and stuff, right? And obviously they're afraid that it's going to run out. And so for them, they fight over, they don't want to share. It's, it's, it's a big ordeal, bigger than it needs to be. But what I try to tell them is that when they share, that when they're being generous towards each other, seeing that, witnessing that, that's going to make me want to buy them, what? More markers when they run out. But when they don't share, when, when, they, when they don't want to be loving toward their sibling over some, some markers that are going to eventually dry up, that, that makes me have a heart to say, you know what? When, when those markers are done, markers are done, right? We're just, no more markers, right? We're just going to get crayons or whatever, right? But when I see them share, that compels me. I want, I want to increase that. I want to provide for them the means so that they can have more markers. And that's kind of how I imagine God to be when he tells us uh, that he, right? That's how, I imagine God tell, that's how I imagine God tells us to be with us as he enables us uh, to continually be cheerful givers. You see, what I mean by that is that God blesses us. Yes? God has blessed you? Has it run out? No. But has it increased? Sometimes. Does it feel like in certain capacities they have, they have stopped? Maybe. But have you realized that when you give, and when you have faithfully given, that God has blessed you more? Right? Why? Because he sees us being good stewards with the blessings that he has blessed us with. And when we are giving with the right heart, when we are serving God with our blessings with the right heart, somehow, in some way, it comes back. Or not that we're giving with the expectation that, yeah, God's, God's going to hug me. I'm going to hook you up, but God's going to hug me up. It's not with that mentality. But there's, there's something dynamic about the way that God sees us and continually enables us and continually blesses us as he is using us to be a vessel of blessing unto other people. You see, when we look at what Paul writes in verses 8 to 11, let's look at that together. He says this, and God... No, no, it's not man, but it's God is able to make all grace abound to whom? You. So that having, having all sufficiency in what? Not just in little things, but in all things, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, you, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. And then Paul goes on to say, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply what? Your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be what? Generous in every way which through us will provide thanksgiving to God. You see, the point that Paul is making is that God is able to do what? God is able to make all grace. Not just partial grace, not just some grace, not just a little bit of grace, but the entirety of God's grace abound to you. And God being the God who is sufficient, not just in the little things, and not just in some things, not just in partial things, but in what? It says what? It says all things. And there's one of the things that it says, at all times. What that does for us is that that positions us to abound in every good work. Why? Because God is able. God is fully able and capable. Right? God is capable and able to supply our every need. And so if God is able to supply our every need, 
then that also includes God supplying us, equipping us, and enabling us for what? Good deeds. For God is stirring up our hearts for good works. And that is something that we must have confidence in because it is God who is providing the very things that we think that we might be lacking. But when we are taking the things that God is blessing with the, blessing us with and being good stewards with the things that God has entrusted to us, will he not in, continually increase that and continue to meet the needs that you and I need to continually do those things? I know I said a mouthful. In other words, that as God is watching us and seeing us work and do things for his kingdom, is he going to allow those things to run out? The answer is No. Just like me watching my kids enjoying and and being great siblings to each other and and drawing whatever thing that is for markers, when it begins to run out, am I not going to increase the supply of markers? And the same thing goes for God. Is God not going to increase your means to continually be a cheerful giver? In other words, as as you are a cheerful giver with the little things, We can have faith and trust and knowing that God is going to slowly increase our means of giving so that we can continually be a cheerful giver when we have the right heart. Let me read you a snippet from John MacArthur on this issue in regards to verses 8 to 11. He says this, God gives his son to whom? All believers. But as previously noted, he blesses in a unique way generous, cheerful givers. In fact, he blesses such believers on such a grand, immense, staggering scale that it it beggars language to express it. In other words, it's hard to articulate. So that's why what Paul is trying to do, right? Paul is trying to trying to convey the magnanimity, magnanimity of God's generosity, right? Paul resorted to hyperbole using a form of the word "pas," which is all in the Greek language. He he uses it five times. In other words, God's gracious giving for us in the way that we should understand it has no limits. It is off the scale. There is no way to measure it. And since giving naturally seems to result in having less, not more, it takes faith to believe that giving will open up God's blessings. Christians must believe that what God has promised to do, that he is able to. To do it. And so here, if God is saying that if you give, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hook you up, I'm gonna give you more, I'm gonna provide the means for you to continually be generous. Would you want to withhold that generosity? And the answer should be no. Why? Because He is enabling you. This is becoming bigger than yourself. This is starting to turn into a form of our worship and our obedience in terms of us being able to give God glory as we are being generous. You see, in other words, in all things, at all times, God is able to supply all that we need. Does he not? And only a few of you said amen. Does God not provide your every need? Does God not meet you? When you need it the most. I mean, he, he might not give you the blessing in the abundance that you desire. But does God ever disappoint? The answer is no. We only disappoint ourselves because we set the expectation too high in our fleshness. Not in, and not with a discerning heart. You see, there is a difference in our giving when we know it's going to run out versus knowing that there is more where that came from. Right? You ever been to a house? You ever been to a dinner? You ever had a gathering? And you know that you got way much food, way so much food in the kitchen waiting. What do you do? I mean, they don't hold back, man. Hey, hey, put some more on your plate. All right, put, your, put, some, put some more on your plate. Oh, hey, hey, here you go. But when you, what do you know when it's, gonna, when it's gonna run out? What do you say? Hey, man, hey, just take what you can eat. All right? Hey, hey there's, there's, there's only five pieces of bacon left and there's six people, man. Just take, if you're not gonna eat it, don't take it, right? You see, you see how we become hesitant, reluctant when we know it's gonna run out? But when we know that there is an overflow, when we know that there is more waiting, when we know that there is more where that came from, what happens to our hearts? We say, hey man, fill up your plate. And here we see God giving the same language, the same intention. There's more where that came from. Don't hold on to it. There is more where that came from. And who is it coming from? Not from you, but where is it coming from? Say it with me. God, come on. 
Can you not see, church, how God is continually enabling you to be a cheerful giver? Why? Because God is saying, like, when you give, there is more where that came from. When your heart is open, there is more where that came from. And here in verses 10 to 11, he says what? He who supplies seed to the sower. Who's providing the seed to the sower? You? No, it's God. Who's providing that? And what's going to come out? Bread for food? Right? Who's going to supply? It's God. But it also says in the same sentence that who is going to multiply the things that you are sowing? Who's going to increase the harvest? Who, are, who is providing all of those things? Not you. But it's God. But it's what you're doing with the things that God is entrusting to you. Or the things that God is blessing you and I with. Man, those, those are things that are meant to reach the unreached. Those are, those are things that are meant to reach the brokenhearted. Those are things to, that are meant to meet the needs of the people to inspire hope. And hope not in this world, but a hope that comes from where? Above. You see, it is God who has provided for us. And guess what? It is God who will continue to provide for you. And that's where the church says what? Amen. You see, another thing we see in God enabling and blessing is that it sheds further light on just how sovereign God is. It is God who has the power. And it is God who has the means, and it is the one, He is the one who is in control of the situation. He is providing, He is more than capable. And there is more where that came from. Why? Because God is enabling you and I to continually be cheerful givers. Notice that God is not, notice that it's not saying God is enabling you to be the, the biggest giver, even though some of us have the means. And that is our way of expressing that joy. Not everyone has the biggest means to give. But guess what? You, you and I, we all, we all are in a capacity, in a place to give and to give cheerfully. The last thing is this. The cheerful giver inspires others to glorify God and to serve him. Giving is inspirational. Right? Have you ever thought, that your giving, that your generosity, that you being a cheerful giver can be an instrument in encouraging and motivating others to glorify God and to serve Him. Right? Not that we're giving out in the open. Hey, man, look at how much I'm giving. Hey, all eyes on me. Check out how much I'm giving. No. But then when they would hear the stories, like, did you know so and so that when we had that fundraiser, that they 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 got there five hours early. And they set up everything. They did all these things. It's encouraging. Hey, did you hear about so-and-so who, 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 who took care of this because they were struggling? That is encouraging. In verses 12 to 15, right, as we get, begin to wrap things up this morning, right, Paul says that the church in Corinth, right, that's who he's writing to. He's talking about how their cheerful, uh, their cheerful giving had this effect. He says, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, right, referring to the apostles, but it is also what overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. In other words, what people are witnessing and seeing how they have helped meet the needs of the apostles, that others are witnessing it, and what are they doing? And praise be to God, they are thinking, it is encouraging the soul. And the verse 13 says, by their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of what? Of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. The fact that giving stimulates praise and thanksgiving to God ought to be a strong motivation for us to be generous and to give joyfully. Why? So that God would be greatly praised. So church, why should we strive to be cheerful givers? Ask yourself this question. Why should I strive to be a cheerful giver? Paul says in verse 13 that they glorify God because of your submission. 
And what he's really talking about is that out of their obedience, meaning that they were doing this voluntarily, they, 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 weren't, they weren't pressured, they weren't manipulated, they weren't tricked, there was no bait and switch. They weren't coerced or anything like that. But it says that they glorify God because of your submission that comes from where? Your confession of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the generosity that follows. Why should we strive to be cheerful givers? And it's because I believe that our giving is reflective of the gospel. Our giving is a reflection, or should be a reflection, of what we have received or what we, or what we continually receive as a result of having life in Christ. But to take that one step further, our giving should become an expression of the gratitude that we carry in our own lives as a result of the never-ending grace that God is continually showing us. Does God's grace stop in your life? No. It's constant. But the way that we understand it increases it, and its effect in our lives as we realize it increases. You see, when we think about what God has given us through his one and only son, Jesus Christ, I believe that is something enough that should stir up within us to become or to strive to be a person who is able to give without restraint, without hesitation, without remorse, and give cheerfully, joyfully, and with praise. There's something about saying, God, be glorified in this giving that increases the joy. There's something about being able to give, saying, God, I know that you're going to do great wonders. I know that you're going to have your way. God, I know you're going to do miraculous things. God, I know that this is going to encourage somebody. I know that this is going to meet somebody's needs. There's something about that that allows us to give faithfully and joyfully. But once again, that's a decision that must be made in our hearts. Right? Just because you heard this sermon today and me talk about it doesn't mean I, that you should just get up and start donating. That's not what I'm saying. If that's your reaction, you missed the point. This is something that must be done because we are making a decision in our hearts to do so responsibly, being good stewards of the blessings that God is bestowing on to us. But we can do so without restraint, without holding tightly onto, without doing this tug of war because, because there's more where that came from. And so church, are you a cheerful giver? My prayer is that this holiday season that you would be challenged to give with a smile and a joy that is contagious that would ultimately lead to God being known and God being praised. I pray that by your giving, people would look to God and they would thank him and that they would praise him. Let us strive to be cheerful givers because we know that there is more where that came from. Amen.